Friends, I want to welcome you in the name of our Lord Jesus Christ to this time of worship. I pray that through our coming together that the Holy Spirit will speak to us uh, about our discipleship. Today we are continuing in the sermon series of Come, Follow Me. Uh, considering the words of Jesus for us today, what it means for us to be disciples and followers, we look at the ancient stories, the stories in the Bible, but we also look at what they mean for us. And today, the focus is on confessing our faith, why it's important for us to confess our faith. And thinking of that, uh, thinking of the value of words and the value of knowing what we really believe in. And it's not, it's not about making a statement forever and ever, because we always evolve and, and discipleship is a journey and things change for us. And sometimes we use the same word, but they mean different things for us. The words about Jesus may mean something uh, really profound today for you, but then something even more important later, if you're going through a hardship, you may speak about Jesus as your friend or as your Lord in times of joy. But when you're in times of trouble, those words take on a different meaning because of that experience in your life. So the invitation is to open our hearts today to look at the story of the confession of faith from Peter. We're following Peter and his discipleship and how he confessed Jesus as the Messiah. But then that confession was not all that it was meant to be. He was thinking, you know, he scored, he did a great job, but then Jesus rebuked him, too, for what he had to say and to help him to understand the meaning of his words in a deeper way. And so today, to help us get started on the importance of statements of faith and our expressions of our faith, we're going to look at a statement from the story uh, from the Church of Canada, United Church of Canada, their uh, confession of faith that was new. It was in 2006. They put a new, uh, called a new song of faith. And this is the part about Jesus. Oops, 
hope that uh, this beginning, uh, thinking of the power of expressing our faith, there are many different ways, but it is the importance of our witness, your witness, your experience of Christ, is the continuation of those stories. If you don't tell them, if you don't express them, it is a, a loss for the world, for those who are around you who wouldn't know these stories of faith. So I pray that today you'll be encouraged, even though it's always hard to express our faith. It is because we, ha we're, you know, with humility, when you think about it, we often get it wrong, just like Peter. But that's the hope, is that even those words that sometimes stumble or don't fully express the fullness of God's love, they still make a difference and they shape our world uh, for the vision of Christ. And so we'll begin with a call to worship with uh, Sherry leading us. Let us join our hearts in worship. Good morning, everyone. It's so good to see you here on such a snowy day. It's just great to see you. Um, I just want to let Melzie Case on the piano know how much her beautiful music has just lifted this church up. She is so good. Um, so thank you, Melzie. <laughs> <laughs> and of course, I'm looking forward to the choir singing this morning. That's a highlight one of the highlights of the service. Uh, All right. Yeah. <laughs> that, that didn't come out right. <laughs> so anyway, please join me in the call to worship. Whether you arrived here first thing this morning or came in as the service was beginning, God bids you joyful welcome. We thank God for this generous welcome. You are precious in God's sight, a delight in God's presence. Lord, we have come seeking your healing mercy. Know that God's compassionate love is poured over you this day. Hallelujah. Amen. Will you please join us in singing him, I want to say it's 263. It's not, oh, no, 262. 262. I got it right. Okay, God, the ages, whose almighty hand. And please stand as you are able.
I invite you at this time to share any joys or concerns that you may have. If you'd like to share something, just uh, raise your hand and share. All right, yes, Carol. Prayers for Charlie's family who moved to more life this past week. Oh, the faith in in this time of trouble. Yeah. yeah. Yes, Michael. Prayers for the family of Dennis Grove from Upper so the family of Dennis Gross? Gross. Growth. Okay, that passed away that, uh, this past week. So prayers for them, and we give thanks for his life. Thanksgiving that the whole Iwanaki family is here <laughs> after COVID rolled through the house and different people. And Rachel, you arrived in time to miss all of that. So we give thanks for that as well. And I'm actually grateful to be here today with you. I wasn't sure if I was gonna make it. Mike had COVID this past week, so I was like, okay, so what do I do? Um, but evidently having COVID and vaccines work, uh, you know, as to build the immunity. So giving thanks to God for being here. Yes. I, I think we owe thanks to God for um, the fact that we suffered, our building suffered yes. uh, terribly with the sprinkler system, and we should be thankful that it wasn't worse. Right, and there and was- there will be positive come out of this. Right, somehow. there was a problem last Sunday, or last Sunday evening, there was a problem, one of the sprinklers uh, failed in the kitchen and there was water and water damage and mm. we're dealing with that and giving thanks for the people who stepped up to help and all the responses that we have in place with the city, they came in very quickly. So we're thankful. Sherry over here. And we have good insurance. There's always a good thing. Yes, we just paid the bill, too. <laughs> uh, prayers for Gary Warren, who is recovering from the back surgery he had on Monday. So prayers for Gary Warren as he continues to recover from back surgery, which he had last Monday. All right. So we'll continue in prayer with Sherry leading us. Lord, today we hear the wonderful words of Simon Peter acknowledging Jesus as the Christ, the Son of the living God. He is given the name Peter, the rock upon whom the church will be built. We would like to be the kind of rock that Jesus could count on, to be strong in the face of adversity, brave when danger is present, compassionate when sorrow and strife prevail. You have called us to be your church, and we ask for your transforming love that we might be better witnesses for you. Today we name in our hearts before you people that we love who are dealing with sorrow and illnesses, people who feel abandoned and alone, we also name those people and situations filled with joy and hope, a new home, the birth of a child, celebrations of special occasions, and often just a beautiful day. Hear the cries of our hearts to you, O God. Heal and transform lives, for we ask these things in Jesus' name. Amen. And we take a few moments of silence to bring before God our own prayers.
And we continue in prayer using the words our Lord Jesus Christ taught the disciples, saying together, Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done, on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread, and forgive us our debts, as we forgive our debtors. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom, and the power, and the glory forever. Amen.
Words create worlds. Last week, I uh, began with really heavy stuff for, for worship. I know the video and the statistics about child abuse were really tough to begin with. So this week, I'm beginning with a joke because it's about the power of words and how our words create worlds. So you're talking about grandmothers, and it reminded me a little bit of uh, my own Bubby. I grew up in Detroit, Michigan, by the way. <clears throat> and I guess I wanted to, to put a, a few stories together about the value of how do you know what to say at the right moment. Uh, this is a, something storytellers are always trying to learn. And I, I learned a little bit from my own Bobby, my grandmother, and she told me this, uh, I leave it to you to decide if it's true or not. I, she's my Bobby, so I guess I believe it happened. Uh, she was a terrible driver, and one day in Detroit, she was driving, I think a, probably about, she told me, 70 miles an hour in a 40-mile zone, and she got pulled over by the police. In Detroit, we call them police. So here's my Bobby with the police, and uh, an officer came up to her and he said, "Ma'am." You were speeding. And, and she said, I know. Little, little Jewish bubby. You, you were going 70. She said, yeah, I know. I know I was speeding. Well, do you have a driver's license? She said, no, I don't. <laughs> what do you mean you don't have a license? She said, I'm legally blind. <laughs> she said, is this, is this your car? She said, no, it's not my car. <laughs> No registration paper? No, no, it's not my car. I stole it, she said. <laughs> Excuse me, ma'am, you stole the car? Yeah, stole it. Who did you steal it from? She said, I didn't ask his name before I, <laughs> before I killed him. He's looking at, at this, my buddy. He said, what, what do you mean, you, you killed the owner of the car? Yeah, she said, <laughs> killed him. Chopped up the body, it's in the trunk. <laughs> He was just so worried now, and he, he backed away from my Bobby, and he called for help. He got back up. Another officer came, told him the whole story. The other officer came, a little more senior than this guy, came up. He had his hand on his gun. This is Detroit. Comes up to my buddy, says, pop the trunk. All right. So pop the trunk. He looked in the trunk, spare tire, nothing else. Very tidy, as a matter of fact. He came up to her, and he said, what? Do you have a driver's license? And she said, I have a driver's license. Everything was fine in the driver's license. Is this your car? Who else's car would it be? Give him the registration, everything fine. The cop couldn't believe it. He said, I'm so relieved to see this. He said, because I mean, my partner told me you'd, you'd stolen the car, you're driving without a license, you're legally blind, you murdered the owner, you chopped up the body, put it in the trunk. No, my Bobby. She's she was the smart one. She looked at the uh, police officer. She, yeah, she said, yeah. Did, he probably told you I was speeding too. <laughs> Words create worlds. When you think about it, you see how what we say matters. What we think matters. Even though we try to say, well, it's just I didn't mean to say this, our words have an impact. And this uh, statement, words, words create worlds, comes from Rabbi Joshua Heschel, Abraham Joshua Heschel. And this is what his daughter said about his saying that. She said, words he often wrote are themselves sacred, God's tool for creating the universe, and our tools for bringing holiness or evil into the world. He used to remind us that the Holocaust did not begin with the building of crematoria, and Hitler did not come to power with tanks and guns. It all began with uttering evil words, with defamation, with language and propaganda. Words create worlds, he used to tell me when I was a child. They must be used very carefully. Some words, once having been uttered, gain eternity and can never be withdrawn. The book of Proverbs reminds us, he wrote, that death and life are in the power of the tongue. So think about that for us. It's why it's important to pay attention to our words and to confess uh, and to really be intentional about our confession. As disciples, we follow the way of life, the way of Jesus and his teachings and action, but our words do matter about our faith because they create an image, uh, a way of thinking about Christ 
that is very essential to the following of Jesus. So even though the discipleship is a way of life, it matters what we think and say about the one we are following. So today we're going to look at the story from Matthew 16, and this is Jesus taking the disciples to an area called Caesarea Philippi. And if you see, it is about 20, 25 miles from the Sea of Galilee, where Jesus was with the disciples. They go up to this city. Now, uh, this, if you look up above it a little bit, you see Mount Hermon. So this city was built uh, around a water. There was a spring of water uh, coming down from that mountain. And mountain series, uh, Mount Hermon series, uh, is something I grew up seeing on the other side. I, we would drive from Damascus to the village where my dad was born, and we'd see this mountain and see the snow and be reminded of the importance of water. So Jesus was taking the disciples to this source of water of the Jordan that w contributed to the Jordan River. This was the main tributary to the Jordan River to remind them that he was the living water. Now that's, of course, interpretation where scholars read the scriptures and know that you know, the writers of the Gospels were very intentional about location. And Jesus, of course, this was a turning point. He was headed to Jerusalem. So you think this was an important time for him to make sure that his disciples understood who he was in a different way. So you have this, this is a rendition of what it would have looked like. It was built, uh, this, the temple was built first by Herod the Great, and then his son Herod Philip built the city, and it was dedicated to Caesar Augustus. But an important part of this temple was dedicated to the god of Pan, Pan, the Greek god of the wild. And so if you, if you think of the word panic, it comes from that, god of the wild. Look, look at this god. What, what do you see when you look at this god? Wildness. Wildness. And what else? Scary. Look at that. What is that that he's holding in his hand? Pretty he's ferocious. Ferocious. <laughs> yes, ferocious. And it was really, in, in a way, it, it fits perfectly with the idea that uh, people saw the emperor as the son of God, the one who really created worlds of peace. And so they really believed that. that that these uh, creatures had a divine power. And so for Jesus to go out there and to challenge that mindset was pretty important. And the location, as I said, is very, very important. And so that's the, con that's the backdrop for the question that Jesus asked of the disciples. Who are people saying that I am? Who, tell me about what you're hearing. And then he drills down and says, but who do you say that I am? Because it was important to him that this is the inner circle. Because if you go out on the street today and ask, you know, who is Jesus? What kind of answers do you get? Varied. Varied. Well, like what? Give me some examples. <laughs> I've heard of him, but I really don't know much about him. I've heard of him, but I don't know much about him. What else? Let me hear good teacher, you know, good moral teacher, good guy. Um, lots of different understandings out there. Even within the church, there are different understandings. So interesting that the disciples exactly did that. They reflected what the people around were saying. But then Peter, Peter is excited, says, I know, I know the answer. You are the Messiah. And Jesus says, you know, you're, you're doing great. But interesting title he gives him. He says, Peter, son of Jonah. Now, another water story for you. Jonah. What about that prophet? Because usually uh, Peter is identified as the son of John. But in this instance, mm. Jesus calls him the son of Jonah. Jonah ran away. Ro Jonah ran away. When it mattered, he ran away. He didn't listen to God. He didn't want to do what God was asking him to do. He didn't want to go to Nineveh. So he was kind of an ambivalent type prophet. Wasn't the greatest. And it's, it fits pretty well with Peter. So let's listen to the scripture and see how of this whole uh, dialogue. And, and I hope you'll keep in mind 
that as, as we listen, keep in mind the background and keep in mind what Jesus was trying to convey. Now, when Jesus came into the district of Caesarea Philippi, he asked his disciples, who do people say that the Son of Man is? And they said, some say John the Baptist, others Elijah, and still others Jeremiah or one of the prophets. He said to them, but who do you say that I am? Simon Peter answered, you are the Messiah, the son of the living God. And Jesus answered him, blessed are you, Simon, son of Jonah, for flesh and blood has not revealed, has not revealed this to you, but my father in heaven. And I tell you, you are Peter, which means the rock, and on this rock I will build my church and the gates of Hades will not prevail against it. I will give you the keys of the kingdom of heaven, and whatever you bind on earth will be bound in heaven, and whatever you loose on earth will be loosed in heaven. Then he sternly ordered the disciples not to tell anyone that he was the Messiah. So here we have, so far, so good. Peter has done well. Jesus agreed with him. Yes, I'm the one they've been waiting for. But Jesus wants to make sure that they understand what they're really getting into and what, what this Messiah business was going to be about, especially as they were headed to Jerusalem. So again, and they're at the place where, you know, they're looking at the God of, of the wild and the powers of the world and, and the might of the military of, of Rome. So from that time on, Jesus began to show his disciples that he must go to Jerusalem and undergo great suffering at the hands of the elders and chief priests and scribes and be killed and on the third day be raised. How do you think that went over? How, did, how do you think Peter reacted? Hmm. Now we're thinking of the Messiah that's going to save us and everything. What do you mean he's going to go get killed? And so Peter took him aside and began to rebuke him, saying, God forbid it, Lord, this must never happen to you. This must never happen to you. Imagine Peter being in opposition to this vision of Jesus. What are you talking about? I love that he dared to rebuke Jesus. Jesus is his teacher. Jesus is the one he's following and trying to learn from, but mm, that's taking it too far. You want me to love my enemies? You want me to really connect like that with others? You want me to accept that your way is not the way of power and violence? But he turned and said to Peter, get behind me, Satan. You are a stumbling block to me, for you are setting your mind not on divine things, but on human things. Then Jesus told his disciples, if any want to become my followers, let them deny themselves and take up their cross and follow me. For those who want to save their life will lose it, and those who lose their life for my sake will find it. For what will it profit them if they gain the whole world but forfeit their life? Or what will they give in return for their life? For the Son of Man is to come with his angels in the glory of his Father, and then he will repay everyone for what has been done. So today I want to invite you to consider your image of, of Jesus in light of Peter's confession, and in light of also what Jesus was trying to convey. There are two titles here in this scripture. One is the Messiah, and we tend to not think much about it because we like to think of Jesus as the Messiah, as the one who was promised, the anointed one who came, and that's the title we, we usually use, Christ, Jesus Christ, meaning the anointed one. But we forget that in that time, a Messiah meant a military leader, and that's what Jesus was really struggling against, saying, uh, I am not another David. I am not another king that's going to come and destroy the other nations and, and rule with power. I am the son of man. So there's a title there that Jesus uses as to help people understand, his disciples to understand that he was 
the Messiah as the Son of Man. So the Son of Man uh, comes from a couple of uh, sources that we can tell. One is from the book of Daniel. There is in the book of Daniel uh, references to the Son of Man, this figure that is going to come and restore the people. But again, a suffering servant type Son of Man title. Uh, and so it says, I saw one like a son of man coming with the clouds of heaven, and he came to the ancient one and was presented before him. To him was given dominion and glory and king kingship that all peoples, nations, and languages should serve him. His dominion is an everlasting dominion that shall not pass away, and his kingship is one that shall never be destroyed. And then in another source uh, from a book called Enoch, and it was written around the time of Jesus, the title again appears, the Son of Man. And bear with me, and, and there is a point to this. There is a really great point because it helps us when we hear Son of Man, it doesn't, it doesn't really translate into much. But the Son of Man in the book of Enoch, it, it, his concern will not be the accumulation of, of power and wealth, but the building of justice and equity. He will remove from their thrones any kings and, or priests who have persecuted or worked against the poor or weak. He will call forth the practice of a politics of justice and economics of, a, of shared wealth that will eliminate poverty and the building of a people in relationship with God. So these are like the highlights from these verses when you read them in the book of Enoch. And then there's the Son of Man will not be a conquering Messiah, but rather a suffering one who will be killed by the systems, but will rise triumphant to sit on the throne of his glory. So you can see Jesus was giving them a very different image a title that would not say, you know, the commander in chief. When you hear commander in chief, Sorry, Australians. I don't know what you call your military leaders. But this is a title when we hear it. What do we think of? Who do you think of? President. The president. But in a specific way, in the sense that the president has the power over the military. And so Messiah was a king, a title they would have really understood that way. Jesus was trying to transform their understanding, to think of his humility, his love, his nonviolence, his way of redeeming those who are lost through love, and the call for us as disciples to do the same, to follow in his way of peace, to follow in his footsteps of seeing the enemy as a child of God, which are things that are very hard for us. So today, the invitation is to answer this question. Knowing how important it is for us to reflect on our faith, who do you say that I am? Who do you say that I am? If Jesus were to stand here today for you, who do you say that Jesus is? And it's a struggle because there are centuries of interpretation and misinterpretation and presentations of Jesus. But today I hope that you will be helped by these two images we reflected on, the Son of Man and then the living water, the source of the living water at that stream, at that spring of water where Jesus was with the disciples, reminding them that he was the source and that he is the one incarnate, is God's love for us to remind us of a very different way, but also to empower us. It's not that, that Jesus is just a great teacher that lived a long time ago, but Jesus is still alive with us. And that spirit of love is still alive. No matter how you reflect on it or, or name this mystery of God's presence, the invitation is to remember that presence is here for you. And it makes a difference. It makes a difference when you say Jesus is king and ruler or Jesus is your friend and companion, or the presence of God, or just a great teacher. So think about those pieces that, that really connect to our own experience. And in order today to connect to this, because, you know, words are always difficult, because you know, I could stand here reciting uh, to you all kinds of creeds and definitions of Jesus, but the invitation is for you to ponder that question. That's really the most important part. 
You can memorize all kinds of statements, but they are empty if they are not built on the relationship, connected to that depth of relationship. And so we're gonna do a little reflection time. And in this reflection time, the invitation is to really uh, use our imagination to spend time with Jesus and let him speak to you about who he is for you. So I invite you to take a deep breath and maybe close your eyes. Center yourself. Pay attention to your breathing. Not change it, but just listen to it. As you inhale, breathe in all the love God has for you. As you exhale, feel all, all your distractions leave you. Any aches, pains, worries, Now picture right before you a large door, standing all alone. Go to the door, push it open, and walk through. You find yourself in a beautiful garden. Take a moment to look around. Maybe feel the grass beneath your feet. Smell the flowers, listen to the birds, and enjoy. In the distance, you see a stream winding through the garden. There is, there is a shade tree next to the stream and a bench beneath the tree. Jesus is there waiting for you. He smiles and calls you by name. You go to him. He takes you into his arms with a warm hug and says to you, I am so glad you came. Come, let's sit down and be together for a while. So you sit on the bench and enjoy each other's company. You behold what Jesus is like. Jesus takes you by the hand and he says to you, I have been with you always through times of joy and times of sadness. And then he points out the stream and invites you to get into the water to renew yourself as you call to mind your baptism or your birth. So together you go hand in hand, and to your surprise, the water is warm and life-giving. Pay attention to how the water feels. Then you and Jesus return to the bench, and as you leave the water, you become completely dry and your heart fills with God's peace. As you sit beside Jesus, you realize you can tell him anything. So you take the time to share with him and then to listen to him. Whatever is on your mind, whatever is on his heart,
Jesus then tells you it is time to go, but he invites you to return any time and says he will be waiting. In fact, he tells you that he will be with you always throughout your journey as your companion. And so we give thanks to God for this time and we pray. God, we thank you for your presence in our lives, for being with us, for this invitation to ponder what you mean to us. Help us as we confess our faith to remember that no confession is final and it is always connected to your love for us, our relationship with you. We thank you for this gift of time with Jesus and pray that we'll remember and live by its grace. For we pray this in his name and in his way. Amen. Will you please stand and join me in singing hymn number 391, Take My Life.
the blessing comes from uh, Barbara Brown Taylor. If Peter is the rock upon which the church is built, then there is hope for all of us. Peter remains God's chosen rock, whether he is acting like a cornerstone or a stumbling block, and shows us that blessedness is less about perfectness than about willingness, that what counts is to risk our own answers, to go ahead and try, to get up one more time than we fall. And so friends, I send you with the blessings of Christ, with the invitation to ponder in your heart your own confessions of faith, of what it means for you to be a follower of Jesus Christ. And may you go in peace and know that God walks with you on this journey, bringing the good news of Christ's healing love to all whom you meet. Please turn to your neighbors and share the peace of Christ with them.